this evening we have a person um, who's an academic and an activist. As an academic, he's a retired professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago, um, where, his, where his own research interest was in urban education reform and social justice. He has edited and written many books and articles on education. Um, as an activist, he became a director at the Children's Community School, which is part of the free school movement. I believe that was in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And he joined the picket lines in Ann Arbor, where they refused to seat African Americans in a pizzeria. And also, many of you know about his other involvements in the 1970s. But without further ado, Mr. Bill Ayers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, AJ, and thank you all for coming out. Um, you can hear me okay, right, in the back? Okay. Mic check. Mic check! I love you. I love you. You're beautiful. You're beautiful. You're beautiful. See, whatever you, whatever, if you get down to the General Assembly, the first thing you want to say is what you want to hear, so thank you. <laughs> Makes you feel better. Uh, I want to say a couple things quick, and then, and then I'll talk for 10 or 15 minutes, whatever. Um, but what I'd most like is to have a dialogue and have a conversation. I was saying to AJ and some of the other folks earlier that what's valuable about something like this is it brings folks together, and we need to come together. We need to face each other and have conversations. I invited our friends picketing out front to please come in and ask pointed questions, because I really do believe that the essence of democracy is conversation, you know, um, uh, between strangers, is meeting each other and talking. And even if you have a community that's somewhat like-minded, it's a good exercise to get together and talk. So that's very important. And I want to give a shout out to Lori Miner, who's behind the coffee bar there. Lori! Lori! Woo! Golden Frog is her joint, and um, and the thing that's important about about her allowing this to go forward, even though there was some pressure asking her not to let it go forward, the important thing is that there have to be public spaces where people talk. Having, having me speak here, even for AJ or you guys or anybody, doesn't mean you're going to endorse everything I say, but it does mean you're committed to the idea that we can have a conversation. I think that's the critical question and I think you all should come back tomorrow the next day and the next day and eat at the Golden Frog so that this public space doesn't disappear. That's my pitch. Okay. I guess what I'd like to do is name, you know, just briefly I'd like to talk a little bit about the role of activism and naming the political moment and seeing if we can um, generate then a conversation about, about what's required of us. Um, uh, I think that we, we, we obviously live in, in difficult times and perilous times. We live in a time of permanent war. We live in a time of gross disparities between the haves and the have-nots. We live in a time really of declining empire where, um, you know, there's a very toxic situation before us, which is the, the, the U.S., which wants to think of itself, and I know we all want to think of ourselves as peace-loving people, but we live in a society that's militaristic and militarized. We have a trillion dollar military budget, more than the rest of the world put together. We have 150 military bases around the world. And if we can't see the ways in which that makes us less safe, not safer, but less safe, then we will continue to perpetuate a kind of a militarized world. I fly a fair amount around the country for various reasons. And I often, at the airport, you know, you've been in the airport where they say, we want the uniformed military people to board first and thank you for your service. And on the one hand, who could object? But I always do object. I always say, why don't you also ask the teachers and the nurses to board first and thank them for their service? In other words, even to use the word service to mean nothing but military service, it seems to me undoes our capacity to build a society that is forward-looking, that's progressive, that's, you know, that's inclusive, that... Um, you know, that, that, what are you doing? Oh, Wait, I'm going to get a mic. Sorry, Mr. Wolf. I solve problems. Ah, uh, dude, it's a problem solver. All right, so this is easier. I don't have to shout. You can hear me. 
Um, and, and whoever wants to talk next, I'll, I'll give you the mic or can, uh, I'll pass it in. Um, okay, so we're living in a situation where with great military power, we also have declining economic, social, and political power. And that is a very dangerous situation. And so it seems to me that all of us have a responsibility to open our eyes and struggle towards a, a society that's more democratic, more peaceful, more participatory, more inclusive, and that, that we can't predict exactly what's going to happen, but if we don't do that, then we're in trouble. I think that there's a very simple way to understand, very simple for me to remember, simple to understand but hard to enact, um, for what it means to be a citizen in this country, or what it means to be an activist, or even what it means to be a moral person. And it's a simple rhythm, and I take it from three lines from a poem by Mary Oliver. Mary Oliver says, in the middle of a longer poem, she has a little section called Instructions for Living a Life. Instructions for Living a Life, and it's very simple. She says, pay attention, be astonished, do something. So let me just unpack that briefly, and then I want to talk a bit about activism. Pay attention, be astonished, do something. Paying attention is the most difficult thing because it's not so simple as just kind of going through life, the habits of a daily life. You have to try explicitly to open your eyes, to question everything that's before you, to wonder about what the alternatives are. I think, you know, if you think about it, everything in front of us is just to taken for granted. Let me, let me do a little thought experiment. Y'all are against slavery, right? Yes. Damn. Wake up. Okay. <laughs> Pay attention. I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to answer. You're against slavery, right? Yes. yes. Thank, thank God. Okay. Um, but if we were living in 1840 and you were against slavery, you'd have been against the Constitution, the founders, the law, both of your senators, your congressmen, the state legislature, the Bible, your preacher, the parents, tradition, everything would have told you. You're out of your mind. And that's why uh, what's his name? Mark Twain wrote a wonderful, wonderful little essay called Free Speech is for the Grave. And it's one of those funny, funny Mark Twain kind of bits where he goes on and on about how nobody wants to be ill thought of and therefore we somebody says, How are you? You say fine. And you know, because you don't want I mean, you know, you don't want to tell the truth because it's just upsetting. So everyone goes along and goes along. And the killing example that Twain gives is slavery. He says, I don't know anyone who's for it. I don't know anyone who speaks up against it. I don't know anyone who's for it, but I don't know anyone who speaks up against it. Now, we, of course, in this room, let's give ourselves a pat on the back. We'd have all been with Harriet Tubman, with Frederick Douglass, with John Brown. We're all key, you know, killer abolitionists, right? That's what we are, because, damn it, we know that now. Let me ask you another question. You're for a woman's right to vote, right? Right. right. Not just the women. When I say that, I want men to say something. Yes, we're for a woman's right to vote, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Okay, but if you were for a woman's right to vote 100 years ago, you'd have been against the Constitution, the founders, the law, your senators, the congressmen, your parents, the Bible, and your preacher. Would you have done it? Let's give ourselves a break and say, yes, we would have done it. But the reason I bring those two examples to the fore is because those are settled for us for folks like us. Those are done. We don't need to question those. But that doesn't help us know who we are today. Because if we open our eyes today and look at the world around us, we have to ask, what are we missing? What are we taking for granted just because it's common sense? And there's nothing more dogmatic and insistent than common sense. It's the most dogmatic thing we have. So homelessness, what are you going to do? You know, Homeless families, eh, what can you do about it? This is the problem that we face, that we don't see in front of us what's going on. So let's think forward a minute. Let's imagine 40 years from now, your granddaughter says to you, um, is it true that when the first African-American president was elected, it cost him a half a billion dollars to become president? And you'll say, hmm, I don't remember that, really? Yes, a half a billion the first time and a billion the second time. And, and, and you say, well, I think he raised it on the internet, and your granddaughter will say, you're an idiot. So, you know, I mean, I don't know that that will happen, but I'm just projecting, maybe. But the point is, we take for granted, don't we, that money and politics, just it's all part of the game. I mean, corporations are people, although 
you know, my favorite magazine, Adbusters, which I've subscribed to for a decade, they have a wonderful page in there which says, I'll believe corporations are people when Texas executes one. And that's what it's kind of <laughs> Okay. The corruption of money in politics goes back to the beginning. I mean, we've seen it all of our lives, right? But nothing is, is more bizarre than the upcoming election, which will be billions and billions of dollars spilled on buying an election. And what makes us different then than any other kind of what you might have called once a banana republic? It's bought, it's sold, democracy for sale. That's a, an example, and I'm not saying it's your example or the best example, but it's an example of what we might be missing today because we breathe in the common sense. We breathe in the common sense of everything that is before us, and we don't open our eyes and ask questions. Here's another question your granddaughter might ask you. Is it true that when you were a student at uh, University of Illinois Springfield, that there were two and a half million of your fellow citizens in prison? Two and a half million. In fact, there was a part of the National Gulag was only 15 miles from your campus. I, when I tell my students, you know, one mile from our campus, 15,000 black men are living in cages. And they're like, really? Yes, really. Two and a half million people, more than any other country per capita. A, a, an absolute um, caging industry. Um, or what Michelle Alexander calls the new Jim Crow, mass incarceration as a political tool. And we're living in that. And your granddaughter, depending on how things turn out, might say to you, didn't you know that? And you say, well, I kind of know, but no, nobody knew what to do about it. There are things to do about it. But you first have to open your eyes and accept that the world you're looking at on the surface is not the whole picture. You have to go deeper. And in an infinite, expanding universe, you can never know everything. You have to keep opening your eyes. Every day, you have to get up and question what's before you and ask yourself, what else? Parentheses. There's no way to be a, a moral person if you don't start with what you see before you. Quick example. There's a wonderful film from a decade ago that won the best foreign film at the Academy Awards called Central Station. Any of you seen it for Brazil? It takes place in the central station of Rio de Janeiro. A, a, a retired teacher sits at a little table like Bernie's sitting at and writes letters. That's what Bernie's doing right now. Uh, writes letters um, for illiterate people. Uh, and she makes a few coins uh, on the side, writing letters for the illiterate, okay? And one day a guy comes to her, in the very beginning of the film, a guy who she recognizes from the daily routine of the central station, comes to her and says, Dora, I'd like you to do a job for me, and I'll pay you $100 if you take the day off tomorrow and do this work for me. What's the job? He asks her to pick up a 10-year-old boy in one part of Rio de Janeiro and escort him across the city and deliver him to another address where, he says, a rich American couple will adopt the boy and take him to the United States. Well, hell, that's a pretty good deal. 100 bucks, that's more than she makes in a month. So she says, sure. Next day, she goes to the address, picks up the boy, makes her way across Rio, which is a complicated city like LA. It's not like getting across Springfield. And, uh, and delivers the boy to the address. She gets her $100, and on the way home, she, she buys a television, goes back to her very modest apartment, and is watching TV when the neighbors come over. And the neighbors ask her how she got the TV, and she relays the story of the boy and the $100. And the neighbors say, Dora, are you that stupid? Are you that ignorant? Don't you read the papers? She says, what do you mean? They say, Dora, that boy wasn't adopted. No one adopts a, a, a 10-year-old. A baby is adopted, but not a 10-year-old. That boy's been sold on the international market. His organs have prob probably already been harvested. He's already been killed. And that's what you participated in. Well, this all happens in the first half hour of the movie. And of course, she's horrified, and so are we. As a Western audience, we want her to do what she, in fact, does do, which is she retraces her steps in an attempt to save the boy's life. Wouldn't you expect her to do that? Once her eyes were opened, she had to act. Before her eyes were opened, she didn't have to do anything. It was just a simple business problem. But once she knew what the terms were, she had to act. And as I see that film, as I've watched it many times, I think it's a metaphor or an allegory for us. What do we not see? What do we not want to see? What are, what, what are we transacting 
that we don't want to know what's underneath it because it would require us to act. I'm suddenly thinking of my beloved mother who was a wealthy suburban woman outside Chicago and she passed away many years ago. But about 25 years ago, I was taking care of her. She had broken her ankle and I was out taking care of her and she had, it was a, a, a drought year and she asked me somewhat innocently, she said, what's this thing I've heard about called global warming? And I, you know, I decided to, I gave her a very mild explanation. I didn't want to scare the shit out of her. And, uh, but I wanted her, you know, she asked, so I told her. After I told her, she looked at me very cold and very kind of unhappy, and she said, I'm sorry I asked. Well, exactly. Because if you ask, you might hear. And if you hear, you might have to do something. In her little world, the lawns were always watered. You know, the swimming pool was always full. So what does she want to hear about global warming? Right? Well, that's the situation of all of us. What are we not seeing? What are we not paying attention to? What are we not attending to? That's the first requirement of living, you know, a, the life of, a, of an active citizen, of a participating citizen. You must pay attention. And then, Mary Oliver says, be astonished. And being astonished, it seems to me, has two qualities. One is, be overjoyed at everything that you see before you. Be overjoyed at the, at the and ecstatic about the beauty of the world, about uh, the wonder of it all, about all of our relationships. It's, ex it's exciting, so be ecstatic. But also, be astonished at the unnecessary suffering, the undeserved harm, the harm that we visit upon one another. And be pissed off about that. Don't take it for granted. Be unhappy about it. Be astonished about it. And you have to be astonished every day. One of the problems we have when we become a little bit aware is we allow ourselves to become cynical. Ah, what are you going to do? Cynicism is a weapon of the powerful. It's a weapon of the powerful. So when we see something like Mitt Romney's 13% tax rate, we should be pissed off, not say, oh, you know, rich people always do that. Be pissed off all over again. Be pissed off at a, a new time. Be freshly pissed off. And, and, and that's because otherwise you sink into a kind of cynicism, which is a form of despair and a form of inaction. So be astonished. And then, number three, do something. You have to act on whatever the known demands of you. You have to do something. You have to act. And in acting, I would add a fourth to Mary Oliver, and this gets to the criticism, perhaps, of the Weather Underground, um, and, and maybe to, to the question of regret. You have to doubt. After you act, you have to doubt. And you have to say to yourself, was, I all, was it all that good? Did we do what we should have done? Did we make mistakes? You have to question whether what you did was really that good, or you become dogmatic. You know what I mean by dogmatic? Perfect example is Monty Python um, and the life of Brian. If you don't know it, go Google it. The life of Brian is one of their funny, funny movies about a reluctant messiah. And the messiah is up on a rampart in some Middle Eastern city, and he's yelling down to the masses below. And he says, I'm not the Messiah. And they say, you're not the Messiah. And he says, no, no, you have minds of your own. And they all say, we have minds of our own. And, and at that point, one of the guys in the crowd says, it's funny, I don't feel like I have a mind of my own. And everybody around him hits him and says, shut up, you have a mind of your own. OK, that's the world we live in. That's the world we live in, where you know the common sense takes over. And so several, I've talked to a bunch of reporters today and others, and one of the questions that uh, that people inevitably ask is, what do you think about Iran having a nuclear weapon? And I'm like, damn, did you, is that an original thought of yours or are you being led around by the nose, you know? I mean, really, you could map how stupid, you know, everything is if you just see how we turn our attention here. I remember my mother again, who knew we were peace activists. I was very close to my mother, lovely person. But she knew we were peace activists and during the first Gulf War, she said to me, again, kind of innocently, I know you kids are against war, but don't you think Saddam Hussein is insane? I'm like, damn, mom, where did you, did you do an independent analysis to come to that, or did George Bush tell you that? You know, I mean, in other words, what does it mean to have a mind of your own and then and then act and then doubt and not get caught up? But one other quick example of dogma, which just popped into my mind. Um, I'm an educator, and uh, when I was first in Chicago, one of my wife's colleagues, my wife is a law professor. One of her colleagues asked me to look at a Montessori school, which, which, which she was thinking of sending her kids to. 
So I went with her and looked at the Montessori school. It's a lovely school. She sends her kids, big deal. But the whole time we were on the tour, the, the head of the Montessori school kept saying to us, now Maria Montessori, the founder of the Montessori movement, would say the children are doing X. Maria Montessori would say the children are doing X. Maria Montessori, Maria Montessori. And I felt like I was being, you know, you know, kind of hypnotized by the music of that line, Maria Montessori says. So at the break, we were having a snack. I said to my friend, don't, think, don't drink the Kool-Aid. And, um, and, and, and the parents were having a conversation about Carl Rogers and Carl Jung, the two humanist psychologists. And after full of that conversation, I said, you know, Jung once said, I'm glad I'm Jung and not a Jungian, because I can still change my mind. To which the Montessori woman said, Maria Montessori said the same thing, and I wanted to go jump up the roof. See, that's the thing. When your dogma is full up, it's too easy to just relax into stupid, you know, kind of automatic thinking. So for people like you and people like me, it's too easy to see the dogma of the House Republicans. Too easy. Our dogma is what we should worry about. Our own set thinking, our own automatic responses. Can't you start to question yourself? Can't you wonder, have I really got it all together? So, that to me is a definition of being an engaged citizen or being uh, an activist. It is pay attention, be astonished, act, and doubt. And then when you do your doubting, when you're doing your rethinking, there's a simple standard to keep in mind. Again, very difficult to uphold, but simple to explain. And that standard is, at the risk of being a professor of education, the standard is a pedagogical standard. And the question that you have to ask yourself when you're rethinking your actions is, did I teach and did I learn? Who did I teach? What did I learn? If you didn't teach and you didn't learn, then the action was bad. It wasn't useful. But you don't always know that in advance, but it's always a standard to hold up after the fact, to say, did I teach and did I learn? Who did I teach? What did I learn? If you're not learning and teaching, then the action was not worthwhile. Even if you felt great racing down the street in your bandana, if you didn't teach and you didn't learn, if all you did was perform, then it wasn't a worthy action. But that doesn't mean that you would know that in advance. I mean, everything I ever participated in, starting at the very beginning, people told me it wouldn't work, it won't work, it won't work. Working isn't the only standard by which we you know, evaluate things, but I think education is. Are we teaching? Are we learning? Um, I'm going to, yeah, so. So, you know, I often think, when I think, about, I, when I think about the calculus of activism, I often think that the important thing is to follow this kind of rhythm and to ask yourself if you're teaching and learning properly, but also to remind yourself that we don't act always simply to see if we'll win. Often people say, well, what, you know, why would I do it if I can't win? Well, you do it because it's, who you, it's how you define yourself. I was born in 1944. I was born under a nuclear cloud. I didn't choose to be born in that world, but it's my responsibility to choose who to be in light of nuclear war. You didn't choose to be born at a time of permanent war. You didn't choose to be born at a time of you know, gross income disparities or mass incarceration or the, the environmental um, uh, de degradation so extreme that it's absolutely killing the possibility of a future. You didn't choose to be born in that but you do have a responsibility to choose who you are in light of that. So we have to remind ourselves as activists that standing right next to the world as it is, is the world as it could be or the world as it should be. And we have a responsibility to either find or tease out or imagine or invent the alternatives to the world as it is. We have to point to the world as it could be or as it should be. Rosa Luxemburg, the great uh, German socialist, was put in jail in World War II. Sorry, World War I. She was put in jail. Um, and there's a wonderful set of letters that Rosa Luxemburg wrote from prison to her friends. And one exchange was absolutely marvelous. Um, a friend wrote to her and said, without you, out, without you out here in the leadership, things are falling apart. We can't get anything done. I don't think we're going to succeed, and on and on and on. Luxembourg wrote her friend back and said, stop whining, which is good advice always. Stop whining. Stop whining. 
There is no social justice fairy that's going to come along. There is no perfect time to act. There is no optimal condition. There's only the here and the now, and there's you and me. That's it. Luxembourg says to her friend, after she says, stop whining, she says, your responsibility, as always, is to be a mensch. Mensch is a Yiddish word. And she says, Luxembourg says, I can't define it for you, but mensch means you have to love your own life enough to appreciate the sunrise and the sunset, to take care of your friends and family, to enjoy a glass of wine and a good meal with friends, to care for the young ones and the elders. But you're, you also have to love humanity enough to put your shoulder on history's wheel when history requires it. Working out that rhythm between loving yourself and loving the world, that's what it means to be a mensch. So my advice is be a mensch, and thanks for coming. So, somebody like to make a comment? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Shout it out and I'll repeat it. Okay, um, I have a little problem sometimes finding left and right. And sometimes the word military, sometimes military is ambiguous term. Um, military industrial complex. I know it exists, but the military, people forget, represents individuals. Individuals, I can talk from my own experience, who think that the people that lead them are pretty crazy. Don't have a lot of confidence in them. So when we talk about military, I remember there's a lot of activists who the military to change the military. It's just not like the separate entity that we oppose. We have to realize a lot of activists within the military itself, and not to separate the individuals out when we start talking militaristic, industrial complex or military. We've got to remember that. That's really important. I love that you said that, and I couldn't agree more. I mean, let's go back to the Vietnam War, which is where I cut my teeth on this stuff. It was very clear to us that the guys who were in the Army were working-class guys who were drafted into it, pressed into it. The kids who are in the military now are, are kids who, m many of my students, you know, they signed up uh, because they wanted to, you know, to go to college. And then suddenly because the world changed and things fell apart they found they had to walk through the furnace of war to get a teaching certificate you know what a disaster what a catastrophe but i couldn't agree with you more that's why you know during the vietnam days one of the most telling things that turned the country against the war was when the vets came home and started telling the truth and when they threw their medals at the white house and when they built their own anti-war organizations, Vietnam Vets Against the War, just like the kids today are building Iraq, Iran Vets Against the War. This is, I mean, Iraq, Afghanistan Vets Against the War, soon Iran, I hope not. Um, you know, this is, th this is something we have to bear in mind. The, one of the pictures that you brought to my mind was when we had surrounded the Pentagon in 1967, and Allen Ginsberg was oming, and he was trying to levitate the Pentagon, and everybody was smoking dope. We were having, some people were having a festival of life, and the militants were doing this and this. And the National Guard had been called out, and they had their bayonets fixed, and they were standing in a line across from us. And my girlfriend at the time, and many other people, and my, myself included, went up and talked to them. They couldn't talk to us. We would go up and stand right in front of them and say, I know you don't want to be here, I want to tell you who I am, and I want to invite you to join us. When the first two guys left the line and came over to our side, it was pandemonium. I mean, because it was—it wasn't that it was the end of the militaristic, you know, you know, defense of the Pentagon. What it meant was, as a metaphor, it meant these things are possible. Let's look at the let's look at the Egypt uh, at the Arab Spring. Look at Cairo. Look at Tahrir Square. If you watched carefully, you saw a bunch of things that were remarkable, one of which was the army, after you know, several days and weeks into it, turning to the other side. When that happened, the die was cast. The, original, the, the driving of Mubarak from power, which was you know, step one of, of the revolution they were trying to make, had happened. So let's remember, they're not only human beings, they're mostly working class folks who are just trying to have a job and trying to get by. And they're not seeing the, the picture maybe the way you see it. But it doesn't mean that we don't have a one-to-one -one relationship and we try to reach out and organize. And frankly, it brings one other thing to mind, just to get a little bit off of this. You know, <clears throat> we were talking earlier about apathy and about what needs to be done. My advice to all activists is 
that we, not only, you know, the rhythm that I've talked about, open your eyes, be astonished, act and doubt, but also that we display our politics publicly once a week, once a month, that, that, and that we organize. So we have to organize. That means going and talking to strangers. It means engaging in conversation. So when I think of my own activism in the 60s and 70s, which is kind of this, it, it happened a long time ago, and I, I actually am not stuck there. In fact, to me, there's nothing more irritating than a person of my generation who's looking longingly at, to a ship that already left the shore. Get off your ass. Do something today. And that's what I was going to tell the old people. Um, but, but, you know, what I remember most clearly is, sure, I was arrested a bunch of times. Sure, I went to jail a bunch of times. Sure, I picketed a bunch of places. All that happened, you know, and then I did other things. But the most difficult things I did are the things that are not known, that are unsung. For example, spending two summers in a row in Detroit, knocking on doors in 1966 and 67 in working class neighborhoods with anti-war literature and asking people to please join our effort to end the war. And in one door, somebody would open the door and say, you're a communist, go back to Russia. And next door, somebody would say, my cousin was killed in Vietnam last year. Please come in, I want to talk about it. And thank you for what you're doing. It was absolutely eye-opening. You know, you learn something about the country, something about the people that you didn't know. Those things take real courage. And I think whatever else you do, talking to strangers in an organized, disciplined way, you and your friends, to pick an area and say, we're going to do that, I think is, is critical. And GIs are very much a part of that. Weather Underground helped kind of open up the door to Cointel Pro and the efforts from the government to infiltrate, to disrupt. I'm curious what your thoughts are on the current state of affairs with NYPD, the Muslim thing there, also you know, monitoring things online. But what are some of the impediments to uh, modern day activism? I, I, missed, I missed the first thing you said, Weather Underground opened up. Well, yeah, it, from what I understand is somebody broke into an FBI office oh. and found documents. Right. Kind of exposing media of Pennsylvania. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I think when you, this gets back to your question too about the military, let's remember Bradley Manning is in the military, and Bradley Manning has been being tortured for a year. And what is Bradley Manning's crime? Bradley Manning's crime is opening up, you know, we. We all know that we live in a 1984 world. You know that, right? I mean, 1984 has happened. So they already know you're here. Uh, they know you're here because you're carrying a cell phone or whatever. I mean, it's easy to monitor all of us. What Bradley Manning and Anonymous and WikiLeaks does, it allows us to watch them watching us. And so Anonymous, in my view, and WikiLeaks, in my view, um, is, is the people's uh, uh, response to being under constant surveillance. We should celebrate them. And remember, Bradley Manning himself Release those documents, which, if you, it, you know, we, we say the Arab Spring began in Tunisia with the burning, with that guy self immolating himself. Well, what happened in Tunisia was the great discontent based on the release of those documents by WikiLeaks. So Bradley Manning leads to Tunisia, leads to Cairo, leads to Madison, leads to Occupy. Let's not forget Bradley Manning. Let's not forget um, the importance of, of opening these kinds of things up. And then, you get the question of what do I think of, um, so I think I think nothing but positive things about that kind of response to uh, for secrecy and, and repression. We're supposed to live in a democracy. Why do we take for granted that the government has to have everything behind closed doors? And then you look at the WikiLeaks files, you look through them, 98% of it is nonsense. Why did they ever you know, um, make that classified? What was the point? Why can't I see that? You know, because they have a mentality that says, you are the riffraff, you don't get to know, we are the sovereign. And, and this is a very important, very important point for folks like us. We, the president, in this case, President Obama, or any other president, President Bush, these people aren't the sovereign. They are not the kings, they are not your king. We are the sovereign and they work for us. So the idea that we kind of genuflect in front of them or worry a lot about them, what do they think of this? When will they bring us peace? They won't bring us peace. They won't bring us health care. They won't bring us the things we need and demand. The only thing that brings those things to us is not the good intentions of the technocrats or the powerful, it's us ourselves. You know, Bob Marley, 
Um, you know, um, I was just hearing Bob Marley today. Um, liberate yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. And it's up to us. So when I'm on campuses and kids say, I hope Obama ends the war, my response is always the same. What have you done today to end the war? What did you do? We're not begging power to do what it ought to do. We have to insist on doing it. And the great, great thing about Occupy, the, you know, and the, uh, get me started on Occupy. The great, one of the great things about Occupy is that it's a metaphor, that it's, a, that it's, a, it's an invitation. It's not a point of arrival. So when I hear all these old guys my age say, oh, they don't have a program. If they're serious, they should join the government. No, they shouldn't. If they're serious, they should do exactly what they're doing, which is creating a public space where every grievance is welcome. They don't need a program. Go back and look at Mario Savio's free speech speeches. He didn't have a program. He had a zeitgeist. He had a feeling. He had a metaphor. And it swept the country. Occupy already won. Occupy already won in the sense that nobody was talking about income disparity before this. Nobody would have given a shit about Mitt Romney's taxes before this. Nobody had the language 1%, 99% before the genius of the Occupy movement. And like every movement that's ever happened, the powerful always have the same response. First you ignore it, then you ridicule it, then you try to co-opt it, and then you beat the shit out of it, and then repeat. You know, ignore, ridicule, co-opt, beat the shit out of it. So when Rahm Emanuel, our lovely mayor, says he'd love to talk to three of the Occupy people if they'd like to come to his office, and they said, you know what? Come on down to the General Assembly, get in line, we'll let you speak. You know, and that's right, that's the right response, because what makes you God of Chicago, you know? And incidentally, if you didn't see, G8 has moved out of Chicago, victory for us, you know, we should claim it, because they realized, yes, exactly, because they realized that they couldn't actually put on their little performance of power without the response that Occupy represented starting in September. So they had a clever idea that they were going to showcase the world through Chicago, and Rahm Emanuel and President Obama were going to get some payoff from that. But thank goodness for us, because now they've decided they can't do it, and it's all understood that it's a defeat for them and a victory for the people's movement. Yeah. 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 Um, the conservative media has been a really powerful force uh, in the recent you know, decade. Yeah. Right. Same to everybody. Yeah, the conservative media has been a really powerful force in the last 15 years, I'd say, uh, since Fox News has come about. And so they've had quite an influence on uh, politics and uh, you know, the national discussion of things. And so a lot of uh, uh, stuff I've heard uh, over the last few years uh, you know, has been you know, one side versus the other. Uh, and then so just tying it in through you know, your personal experience with the conservative media, last month I've heard I heard the uh, Andrew Breitbart side of his story about having dinner at your home what with that? Bernadine Dorn. Oh, that that you were a very good cook. He said. And, and he said I was charming. And he said you were very charming and too. And he said my wife was hot at seven. I did not. Know, I did not hear that part, but and, I will. And I will, she is. <laughs> I believe you. Um, my question is, I'd like to hear your side of what that story was and, and how the dinner was, uh, and you know what you think about what he is supposedly going to release or what's going to come out in the next seven to ten days. Well, I have no way to speculate on what Andrew Breitbart was going to release. Andrew Breitbart, as you might know, was the conservative flamethrower who brought down Horn and, uh, and um, Andrew Weiner and got Shirley Sherrod fired. And he, he um, uh, dropped dead suddenly outside of his home in L.A. last, uh, last week. Right? At the age of 43, which is very young to have a sudden death and, and sad. Um, what happened, for those of you who don't know, is that um, my, my wife and I are on the board of a small program um, called uh, The Public Square, which sponsors public conversations like this, mostly in barber shops and coffee shops throughout Chicago. And we've been on the board of it for 10 years. It's a program of the Illinois Humanities Council. And as we have done 20 or 30 times before, um, we offered as part of a fundraiser to cook dinner for six people. Um, and we thought it would go as it has 20 or 30 other times, which is people bid on it, it goes up to 200 and 300, and then for $400, six people come, and I cook them a great meal. And that's what we figured would happen. 
Well, the Fox News host and Daily Caller editor, uh, Tucker Carlson, um, uh, bought the dinner for $2,500. And uh, he pushed a button on the, on, the, on, the, on the auction, buy instantly for $2,500. And of course, it was kind of a fraternity prank, and I knew he was up to some prankstery thing. But we, we, you know, I felt like I am a big believer in talking to strangers. I have no fear of talking to Tucker Carlson or whoever he wants to bring. So he ended up bringing five people, two young reporters from his, um, from his Daily Caller, Andrew Breitbart, the, the flamethrower, um, a woman who had won a contest of having the most interesting question to ask me, and his brother. So I cooked the dinner. Uh, if you're interested, it had hoisin ribs and cucumber salad for an appetizer, carrot ginger soup, blah, blah, blah. And dessert was um, American, uh, I mean, was apple pie and Americone cream ice cream. Okay, so um, so it was a lovely dinner, and we marched through it fairly quickly. They chose Super Bowl Sunday to have the thing, so we had it at a friend's apartment. We, it lasted all of an hour and a half, and, oh, and I, I, uh, there was a lot of theater to it. I had printed up the menu on cardstock, and everybody at their place had a menu, and it had the menu, and at the bottom it had two quotes, one from David McCullough, who had won the um, uh, Medal of Freedom from George Bush, the historian, and the quote from him was, thank God and my parents for an education in the humanities that has made all the difference in my life. And uh, the second quote was from Tucker Carlson himself, and it was, whenever I hear the word humanities, I reach for my pistol. So, uh, so I thought that would be funny, and he thought it was funny. Um, everybody got a swag bag of chocolate kisses in one of my books. My books are for sale right here. Um, and, um, and at every place setting, there was a cutout postcard of some famous American. So one was Rosa Parks, one was uh, Gertrude Stein, one was Sarah Palin, and you could kind of choose which place you wanted to sit at. The dinner went fine. We had several conversations and arguments. Um, so a couple of my favorite moments were I asked um, Tucker where his kids went to school, and I won't tell you where they go to school. They go to a prep school, a boarding school, and that costs $40,000 a year. Um, and he has four kids at this prep school. And, um, and I asked him if he liked it. He says, a little too liberal, but it's okay. And, and then he said to me, unsolicited, he said, you know what the difference is between my kid's school and a Chicago public high school? I said, what? And he said, the difference is we can fire the bad teachers. I said, that's it? You mean, you mean the fact that there's only 10 kids in a class and that, and that these kids are all from privileged backgrounds and that, you know, you know but that's, the, that's what I mean about when I was saying earlier about how an issue gets framed. Education is really my world. And, and here's one great example of framing. And we have to think about framing in all these areas. But, but this is a great example of what Tucker said to me because if in the public conversation, whenever John McCain got to a microphone, he would, and now it's happening all over again with the, with the new election, these guys get to the microphone and they say, we, you know, the, we need to get the lazy, incompetent teachers out of the classroom. As soon as they say that, as soon as they frame the issue that way, they win. What am I going to do? Stand up and say, my granddaughter deserves that lazy, incompetent teacher. Leave her right where... She, they win. If I get to the microphone first and say, every kid in a public school deserves a caring, compassionate, morally grounded, intellectually committed, well-rested and well-paid teacher in the classroom, I win. So the question is, who's framing these debates? Who's framing them in a way that, and, and we were talking earlier, Jeff and I, you know, Jenny and I, that, that a great example of framing and reframing just happened in front of us, which was the Virginia assault on women, where they, in order to get an abortion, in order to get abortion counseling, you had to have a transvaginal, um, uh, what's it called? Ultrasound. Ultrasound. Transvaginal ultrasound. I loved Saturday Night Live. Um, uh, they did a skit about uh, this woman saying, I fly transvaginal airlines. I have the best <laughs> miles. You know, I have more miles and I know what to do with it. Well, the great reframing of that was when women across the board and across political orientation stood up and said, that's rape. You can't do that. You can't require a woman against her will to have somebody invade her and then call that law. You're legalizing and they won, they beat that back. And similarly, the attack, you know, the three-day sustained attack 
on this young woman, not a public figure, the, the young law student from Georgetown, not a public figure, not a candidate for any office, just a woman who had an opinion about contraception and the, the pillaring of her and then the, the, the pushback um, by women and men really all over the country was marvelous. So it shows you the power of reframing. We have to reframe so many issues, mass incarceration, war, um, taxation, all of these things are dying to be reframed. And that's what I think we should do. So that's my take on the dinner. Is that okay? Yes. Well, first of all, you know, the, the old saying, you get the government, you deserve it. Um, okay. The old saying, you get the government that you deserve, does not apply to you. I think uh, I admire you. For, I think you are you deserve a better government than we have. Because so do you. Because you're an activist, and uh, I admire you for your dedication and your sincerity, what I believe I see is sincerity. Um, now, my basically, though, what I really, the point I'm going to try to make, or the question I'm going to try to ask you, is uh, I'm going to stand next to Joe so you're friends. Okay. He's running for president. This will help. <laughs> <laughs> the, the question I really would like to ask you, and, and it comes later because I, I think I know the answer, is why, what, okay, I, I think that uh, you and Ron Paul, for example, almost every activist I hear speak. I would think would be a hardcore Ron Paul fan, like Sarah Palin, for example, or anybody who's in favor of ending the war, in favor of shrinking the government, et cetera. Um, so <clears throat> I think I know the answer to the question, which is you don't see there's an issue with the Constitution that I think you, you take issue with the U.S. Constitution, which is fine. And, you know, you made two points. Uh, slavery was... Uh, constitutional at one point, so was the uh, uh, women's, so, uh, you know, anti, so women didn't have to vote, whatever. Okay, the point is that, that the Constitution has been amended to allow these things to occur and to, you know, prohibit slavery. Um, the, the issue I have is Ron Paul is uh, a student of Frederick Bastiat. And Frederick Bastiat's main premise was that no one would care who's president. And this goes back to your your issue about half a billion dollars to run. People want to be president really bad. Yeah. George Washington did not want to be president. Exactly. See, the founding fathers, that was service. That was a, uh, to be president was a, a sacrifice, okay, if you will. So today in America, people will spend a billion dollars to be president. Why is that? Because there are so many people that that will <clears throat> that will uh, you know have an advantage by who the president is or who's in office. So there's a lot of people who will prosper. Okay, Frederick Bastiat, however, uh, who was a constitutionalist, said that if you follow the law strictly or the constitution in our case, however it's written at the time. <coughs> You won't, it won't matter who's in office because you won't have what he calls plunder as a result of any individual who's president or in office. So I guess my question is, what? how are you different than Ron Paul in that you don't like the war, you don't like the prison, the idea of the prison industrial complex? Um, almost every, you know, lockstep, in fact, are you with Ron Paul, for example. And so, you know, you know the thing. I saw your Ron Paul T-shirt earlier, and I knew we had a lot in common. Yes. And not everything, but a lot. Well, um, he's yeah, I mean, I, I was being picketed by a Ron Paul person last year. Um, I, actually, a whole bunch of people were picketing me. I went out and said to them, first two guys I came to, I said, "Why are you picketing me?" And they said, "We don't know anything about you, but we heard you like Obama." And you're picketing. That's, I said, "That's guilt by association. Don't tar me with that guy's policies." Um, <laughs> Then I ran across a Ron Paul t-shirt and I said, I bet you and I agree about a lot of things. He said, like what? And I said, like ending the war. He said, absolutely. And I said, like full queer rights. And he said, absolutely. And I said, even the right to marry. And he said, no, 
the state shouldn't be involved in anyone's marriage. I said, I agree with you. Let's, I'm going to get mine annulled. And um, so we agree 100%. Full queer rights, nobody gets married. I like that. Um, but we don't agree 100%. And, and that's because there's complicated things that have to be worked out. It's not, I wish the world were so simple that we could say, like, like at this Tucker Carlson dinner, Jamie Weinstein was sitting next to me. I said to him, he said, uh, Gingrich isn't a real conservative. Romney's not a real conservative. Santorum's not a real conservative. I said, what the hell's a real conservative? He said, small government. I said, well, gee, that's pretty easy. Somalia, that's got a small government. You know? <laughs> and, and if small government makes you go to Somalia, man, that's really small. In fact, it's a non-government. I actually think it's a little more complicated. I think there are things that we have to work out, and I'll give you a couple of examples. One is, I don't believe that the Ron Paul people, like maybe Ron Paul himself, because he is a remarkably consistent, which you kind of have to admire him for that, remarkably consistent. Um, no flip-flopping there, you know. Um, but, but even then, I have problems, because I believe, and I think it's demonstrable, that all any government does is tax and spend any government. So you all rolled over here on a socialist highway. I mean, weren't you ashamed of yourself to be on that socialist highway? Um, you know, and, and you've seen these analyses, but it's true that the red states actually take more money from the federal government than the blue states. If you have a port, an airport, an interstate, a railroad, you're sucking off the public breast, you know? And, and we're paying for that. And frankly, I'm happy to pay for it. I want the roads to pay, you know, and so on. In fact, for example, in Chicago, you know, where they're privatizing everything. Privatize this, private. Private is good. Public is bad. Public is always tyranny. Well, let's just take garbage pickup. I'm actually glad that we have a socialist garbage pickup in Chicago. <laughs> um, I want socialist garbage. And the reason I want it is because the guy next to me is kind of a slob. And I could just, I, I would have to spend all my time training the rats to stay on that side of the fence so that they knew that you can eat that guy's stuff and go into his house, don't come into my house. No, nope. the socialist garbage pickup is good. The socialist fire department is good. It's a good thing. And the astonishing thing to me about all the people who are frightened of socialism and stuff, what's the biggest job creator in the country? The military and the prisons. And these are projects of the government. But. But this is why, rather than have this kind of what I think of as a, a kind of futile argument about whether you're for small or big, is we should say, we should ask a different question. Who do you want to tax? What do you want to spend on? Who do you want to tax? And what do you want to spend on? Because you're going to tax somebody and you're going to spend on something, or you wouldn't have a dam, a railroad, a road, garbage pickup, or a fire department. So who do you want to tax and what do you want to spend on? I want to tax the rich, and I want to spend on on things like education and health. I do not want to tax the poor and spend on military incarceration and surveillance. Those are the things I don't want. Okay. So, one other, one other thing about the other thing. The government doesn't build dams and highways. Well, they pay for them, absolutely. They don't and, have to, but they do, and, and the, thing, it's the thing is... They only do that if you wear seatbelts and don't smoke in bars. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the seatbelt, you know, this is another example where, oh, the government's always bad. Like, now the government's trying to make a big nanny thing about what kids should eat. Keep the government out of that. Yeah, keep the government out of smoking. You know, out of, they shouldn't put those warning labels on. That's unfreedom. But the fact is that at the end of the day, somebody walks into an emergency room bleeding, we take care of them, and that is something that we all are going to share that burden. So why not have a public campaign about what we eat and what we smoke and so on? Because at the end of the day, you're going to pay. And this is another example, incidentally, of framing. If I said to you, and I will say to you, shouldn't people take care of their own health, God damn it? Yeah. We will all say yes. And if I said to you, somebody was just hit by a car out there, should we go help? We'd all stampede out to help. Maybe not the Ron Paul guys, but the rest, of us, the rest of us would definitely go help. And so the question is, which of those models is a metaphor for healthcare? And in my view, the model that makes more sense is the model that says, if he's bleeding, I'm going to help him. And if he's bleeding, why don't we all help him? And you know what? He didn't ask to be run over by that car, and he didn't ask to be whatever. But so. So I just think it's a little more complicated. And one last thing, besides the Socialist Road, which incidentally is the name of a pamphlet, <laughs> the Socialist Road, but I meant the highways. Um, 
I mean, literally. Jim Hightower, right? Now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But but uh, but the other thing that I would point to in Ron Paul, and the reason I'm not 100% Ron Paul, is that he wants the government to be out of your business, including when the government says, you know what, you can't discriminate against black people. You can't. And Ron Paul says, that's unfair. That's the end of freedom. I'm sorry. We have a history in this country of deep, deep abiding white supremacy. And it's good if we can convince the government to enforce the fact that actually black people can ride in the front of the bus, black people can come into a public uh, train without being discriminated against. That's a good thing. And Ron Paul thinks it's a bad thing. So that's where we get off. I'm sorry. I don't think he thinks it's a bad thing. I think he definitely thinks it's a bad thing. I think we should we should use our, our community power together to say we're going to we're going to shame you. I couldn't agree more. If you come in here, I couldn't agree more. I don't think it's primarily a legal question, but I think you're mistaken. And you can go back and read all of Ron Paul's pronouncements on Martin Luther King Day is a is a hate whitey day. Well, that's a constitutional thing. Uh, yeah, I know, but, but get over that, you know. So no, I don't agree with Ron Paul on all those things. I actually think, I, I think that I want to be and have always been an activist against white supremacy. And I think white supremacy abides in this country. It's not something we've done away with. We've made progress, but we have not done away with it. And because we haven't, I think we have serious issues to still deal with. I don't think Ron and I agree. Now, I'm going to come back to you. I'm not going to ignore you. But I'm going to go to the sister over here and then over here. Um. In your opinion, what is the difference between the Occupy Wall Streeters and the Tea Partiers? <laughs> well, the big difference is the Koch brothers haven't given the Occupy people any money. <laughs> 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 uh, you know, the other thing is the Tea Party got its got got its energy um, from opposing um, the Obama administration and the Democratic Party, and and they're anti-government. And so if you ask that, uh, not, not, that's not across the board. The Tea Party is a metaphor also, just like Occupy is a metaphor. But there's a lot in the Tea Party that I actually find refreshing. I find the citizen activism refreshing. I find the, uh, the I, you know, I'm fed up and I won't take it anymore refreshing. Mm -hmm. But I think that what they miss, and they miss it badly, is that Wall Street is pulling the strings on so much of what's going on. And that's where we have to aim at least some of our fire, and that's what Occupy has done so brilliantly. In the back. Hey, Bill, I don't really need a microphone. No, I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, I want to thank you first for coming to Springfield. I risked a speeding ticket coming down from Chicago. So did I. So did I. I, I think you passed me. <laughs> I knew it. Anyways, I, I wanted to ask you a question. I mean, I got a lot of respect for all the work you've done as an activist. And as a young activist, looking towards the future in the 21st century, looking for, well, let's say activism and being an activist is a lot like any trade. You know, carpenters have certain tools, electricians have certain tools. What are the tools of the 21st century activist, in your opinion, and coming from the perspective of somebody that, you know, worked with the tools of the 20th century, which were revolutionary then, what are, what are the, what are similar things, or what are things that we can use now that are similarly as, as revolutionary? I look at the internet, as sort of a huge resource and a lot of websites and things like that, creating your own media. What are your thoughts on that subject? Well, I'll give you a couple of thoughts, but I think you're more the expert than I am on that. But I would say that that the um, what you're what you're absent. I'm not a tactician. I've never been a tactician. I don't really know much about tactics and how to think about them. But what I do think is that is that um, think you know every revolutionary movement, every movement of any kind has its own media, has its own press. So we had the underground papers, the abolitionists had the abolitionist papers, you know, and so on. You have more than we ever had in terms of access to knowledge and information and the ability to spread it like a virus. It's amazing. So I've been, I've participated in three flash mobs, blow my mind every time. And one was in downtown Cairo, in Tahrir Square, in Cairo, a year before the stuff beat off. We were there trying to get to Gaza and we, and we were hemmed in by the U.S. and and Egyptian forces. So we had a flash mob. That was the first one I'd ever been in, and it blew my mind. I would look, if I were you, to, there's three things I would look at. I would look at, um, I would look at Eric Mann's book, um, uh, Playbook for Progressives. You can find it online, Playbook for Progressives. It's one of the neatest little simple things about all the things you need to be able to do. And it includes things like research, 
like you know, looking into things so that you're not just shooting in the wind, but you're actually knowing. Um, so that's one. I would look at the Yes Men. Do you know the Yes Men? Okay, I just spoke uh, at the Yes Lab at NYU last week. The Yes Men are these interventionist artists. I'll give you an example of what they do. Well, one thing I brought back to Chicago from them is they have these little stickers that they put on water fountains all over New York, and the sticker says, has a picture of a water spout, and it says, this water is assumed to be safe, and then a quick couple of sentences on fracking, and what fracking does to the water, and then at the bottom it says, if in doubt, strike a match. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's so clever, and it just like flips the thing. Um, I have my Adbusters here with me. You should certainly subscribe to Adbusters. You know, Adbusters is the one they mess with the ads. You know that picture of the hauntingly beautiful woman, and at the front top it says L'Oreal? This is all over billboards. L'Oreal, and then this beautiful face, and then at the bottom it says, because you're worth it. And Adbusters goes around to those billboards and puts at the bottom, because you're worthless. <laughs> you know, that, that kind of, I mean, to me, those kind of, and, and Adbusters calls itself uh, the journal of the, of, the, of, of the mental environment. And it's all about changing the frame, getting you to see something you didn't see before, because they mess with the, you know, the kind of common sense of it. So, say again? Detour man? Yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. Okay, the other one that the Yes Men, this is the kind of things Yes Men are famous for. Um, they did a piece, they link up with other activists, so there are a bunch of Peabody Coal activists who wanted to do something on the environment. So they linked up with the Yes Men, and this is what they came up with after weeks and months of work. They, they built a, um, a, a website called Coal Cares. Coal Cares, and it looked exactly like the Peabody website. And what it said was, it started by kind of an assumption. Of course, coal causes all kind of respiratory problems, but we care, and so here's our answer. And then they have all these respirators that you can buy that are cool. Like you can have a Barbie doll respirator, or you can have a Star Wars respirator, or you can have an Avatar respirator. But to get you started, they'll give you an infant respirator for free. And, and you know, so they put this up online. They sent out 80,000 press releases about it. It was picked up by the AP and the Wall Street Journal as if it was legit. And immediately, my friend Andy gets a letter from the White Shoes Law Firm representing Peabody, a cease and desist letter. Cease and desist. We demand that you stop. We're going to take you into court, blah, blah, blah. Andy writes back and says, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to just have Peabody. I'll have a rotating logo with all the coal companies. And they dropped it. Why did they drop it? Do you really want to mud wrestle with a bunch of clowns in federal court the whole time making your... The other one they did that you might remember is that GE didn't pay any taxes last year. <laughs> GE paid no taxes. That meant that means you paid not only a higher percentage, you paid more actual money than GE paid even though they made $6 billion in profit. So you paid more than them. So. Um, they broke into their system and they have a way of mimicking all this stuff and they sent out a press release. We've changed our mind, we've decided we are gonna pay our fair share and here's what we think our fair share is. GE had to issue a denial and say, no, no, that was a joke, we're not paying taxes. Great. So, so I think besides the obvious thing, social media, besides, I think humor is a very generous way to organize. Humor and a kind of a, a getting away from the kind of earnestness that we sometimes, and this is why, incidentally, that young people and me, old people, look to things like John Stewart and Stephen Colbert and The Onion to tell us the truth about what's going on in the world because with humor, they're able to reveal things that the earnest people are hiding or bullshitting us about, right? Um, so The Onion headline last week was, Iran objects to the 8,500th nuclear warhead in the United States. <laughs> Get a grip. Get, get your, wrap your mind around that, right? So those are just a few reflections on it, but I think it's an excellent thought. You bet. Uh, yes? Okay. Uh, yep. Why don't you take the mic? Oh, okay. Hello. 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 Uh, you, you talked about um, Michelle Alexander and mass incarceration. And uh, it's been kind of a fix it, uh, fixation of mine since I read her book, The New Jim Crow. Uh, she pinpoints the cause to the war on drugs, mandatory minimum sentencing, um, the, uh, the telephone crime political culture of the 80s and 90s. Uh, and, and if you were to examine the chart of the prison population from the 
time it's been measured to now, uh, at about the beginning of the 1980s, you'll see something like a 70, like a 70 degree line showing the increase uh, that, that tracks the prison population from less than 500,000 people to about 2.5 million. So um, this to me seems like a causal relationship. It's not that there was this great crime uh, outbreak. It was a recategorization of crime. So my question to you is, um, can there be any kind of legitimacy in the system where this is possible? And if so, uh, is, is change possible in such a system? You know, I, you, you mentioned something about cynicism. I'm, I'm not cynical, I'm just kind of forewarned. You know let, what I mean? Let, let me argue about cynicism. <laughs> 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 well, that's all. You know, the question, is change possible? I mean, you know, the month before Occupy happened, it was impossible. And the month after, inevitable. And, and frankly, I'm old enough to know that the month before Rosa Parks became Rosa Parks, it was impossible. And a year later, it was inevitable. And that's the nature of every revolution you've ever heard of. It's impossible before it happens, and it's inevitable once it happens. So is change possible? It's not only possible, it's happening all the time. Progressive, thoughtful, plan change, very, very difficult. But it's always in flux and it's always in yeah, of course. You know, the change in the point of the winds as they're blowing. But this is, yeah, but this is what I mean. Right, I understand that, I, and it's a big system, and it's a big monster, and who knows, our chances might not be that good, but what are you gonna do? Throw up your hands and sit on your couch? No, you're gonna go talk to strangers and do your best and use all of your intelligence and humor and, 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 and will and everything to try to make a difference. Look, another world is not just possible, it's inevitable, it's coming. Will it be a better world? We're not sure, because and that's why I'm not an optimist. People often accuse me of optimism. An optimist think, thinks he knows what's coming. I have no idea, but I'm not a pessimist either. Rather, I choose to be hopeful. I get up every morning thinking, this today, I'm gonna change this motherfucker. And then I go to the bed every night, disappointed. And then I wake up the next morning, damn, then today is the day, you know, because because if you do it any other way, and that's why I say, confidence and hope are a choice, and we should choose confidence and hope. I've been talking a lot about this question of framing, and one another one popped into my mind because you brought up Michelle Alexander. I'm a big, 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 huge fan of Jane Addams. You know Jane Addams, the great social worker, and one of the things I love about Jane Addams, I don't know. I'm on the board of the Hull House Museum up there. You ought to come up and see it if you haven't. It's a brilliant, brilliant, lovely place. And Jane Addams, one of the reasons I love Jane Addams is because J. Edgar Hoover called her the most dangerous woman in America when he was young, and then when he was old, he called my wife the most dangerous woman in America. So, <laughs> I feel like we're late. Um, but but, but you know, the thing about Jane Addams is she lived in solidarity with the poor, not in service to, in solidarity with. This is a stance we can all take to our advantage. That is, why minister to the people? Why think that your greater education and your greater access and so on should give you the right to, to tell people what they need? The really powerful thing is to live in solidarity with people. Move into the neighborhood, be with them, look at their problems through their eyes, and in that way begin to craft solutions. But. I'm saying that all about the great Jane Addams to point something out about framing. One of the people that Jane Addams worked with, one of the women of Hull House, was um, uh, Florence Kelly. Well, Florence Kelly was one of them, but, the, but it's the woman who was the journalist who wrote against lynching, Wells Barnett. Um, what was her first name? Ida. 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 Ida B. Wells Barnett, exactly, exactly. So I, I read the book, Ida. A brilliant new history of Ida B. Wells Barnett. And um, Ida B. Wells Barnett spent 40 years campaigning against lynching. And one of the things this author found as she was doing the research on this book is she found a letter that Jane Addams had written to the Chicago Tribune in 1910 or 1912. Now listen to this. This is the great Jane Addams, a socialist, a pacifist, uh, a, a lesbian, uh, although that word wasn't, you know, used, but but an amazing woman, an amazing woman, a woman of wealth who, who kind of used all of her skills and wealth and so on in, in the interest of social change. 
Um, so I love Jane Addams. Here's the letter she wrote to the Tribune, objecting. You know, in those days, you could read in the Chicago Tribune every week, just like today we read about a teenage killing or a gun atrocity or something. Then you could read about a lynching. Every week in the Chicago Tribune, for about 30 years, there was a lynching that you could read about the Chicago Tribune. So Jane Addams wrote a letter objecting to lynching and part of the campaign against it. And here's what she said. Lynching is the wrong way to combat black criminality. What? The wrong way to combat black criminality? Was lynching about black criminality? Well, that's what Ida B. Wells spent a lifetime trying to reframe. It wasn't about that. It was about terror against an entire community at the moment of modernity and industrialization. Lynching was social control, but it took Ida B. Wells and a bunch of other people to convince even people as brilliant as Jane Addams that that was the wrong framing. There's a better frame. So yes, we can change, we can move. I've changed, you've changed, we can all change. But it requires us to link up with each other, to try to rethink, to go to the root of things, to try to um, you know, offer better solutions. I'm writing a book right now called What If? And the subtitle is Releasing the Radical Imagination. And the chapters are things like Abolish the Prisons. And when I said that to Bernie, he was like, wait a minute, what are you going to do with the murderers? <laughs> and uh, that's what I expected him to say, and that's what I expect you to say. Abolish the prisons. So he said, and I agree, but you got to have a prison cell for John Wayne Gacy. I said, right, I'll give you John Wayne Gacy. I'll give you Bush and Cheney. Who else? <laughs> And, and the reason I say it that way is because as long as we think the default position is crime, prison, misbehavior, prison, mistake, prison, as long as that's how we think, well, then you get two and a half million people in prison. Which incidentally, the causality of that also has to do with if you plot, you were talking about certain maps, if you plot lynchings at the first half, at the last half, uh, at the turn of the last century, with executions today, county by county, almost a perfect overlap. That should tell us something. That should tell us something about the use of the death penalty as a form of social control and so on. So all I'm saying is, yes, we can change. Yes, another world is possible. Yes, let's get busy and make it happen. Well, uh, yeah, Howard Zinn uh, said, the best time to protest of war is before it starts. So in context of the current Iranian situation and uh, the, your ideas of framing, like you mentioned the Onion article, what, what can we do to uh, shift the uh, debate from uh, the sinister Persian menace to uh, <laughs> something a little bit more like, uh, let's just not do this. Yeah. We've been through two already. Yeah. Well, we got two going on active right now, and we seem to be in a certain, uh, you know, a, a perpetual state of permanent war. I agree that the best time to, to, to try to end a war is before it starts. Many of us were out in the streets March 15, 2003. And the problem with that demonstration, which was the largest anti-war demonstration I've ever participated in, in spite of the mythology of the 60s and all that, um, actually, I happened to be on a book tour that day, and I was in San Francisco. I was at a school, and I marched with the kindergartners, and they were all carrying signs that said, um, use your words. You know, that's what he said. You know, like George Bush, use your words. Um, you know, uh, I mean, but, but I think I think that the, that the best we can hope for, I think the country, I mean, the good thing, let's pat ourselves on the back. When G8 goes to Camp David, let's claim victory. Yeah. When these guys have to lie to us perpetually to get us to go to war, and the lie lasts for a year and a half, two years, sometimes three years, and then we wake up because we are not a warlike people. We do not want war. Most of us are really against war. But we get sucked into, we're fighting for freedom, we're fighting for democracy, we're fighting for this, we're fighting for that. I just remember that I had this wonderful, wonderful quote from uh, George Orwell, who I love, and he wrote a piece called Notes on Nationalism. Listen to this, and if this doesn't describe us, although he wrote it in 45. All nationalists have the power of not seeing resemblances between similar sets of facts. A British Tory will defend self-determination in Europe and oppose it in India with no feeling of inconsistency. 
Actions are held to be good or bad, not on their own merits, but according to who does them. And there's almost no kind of outrage, torture, the use of hostages, forced labor, mass deportations, imprisonment without trial, assassination, forgery, bombing of civilians, drone strikes, he doesn't say that, which does not change its moral color when it's committed by our side. The nationalist not only doesn't, does not disapprove of atrocities committed by us, but it has a remarkable capacity for not even hearing about them. Our job is to wake up. Our job is to expose it. So I don't know if we can prevent what's about to happen in Iran, but we can go out and talk to our neighbors. I, I remember very clearly in the 60s when I first met the Vietnamese in Canada, there were no Vietnamese in the United States, and we told them all of our grand plans for all of our demonstrations and all of our revolutionary aspirations, and they listened patiently, and then they said, have you talked to your Republican parents yet? And we were like, outraged. What? Talk to them? I would never talk to them. Yes, talk to your Republican parents. Talk to everybody. Talk far and wide. And point out, as you just said, not only is this kind of warmongering at the highest level, but we've already spent billions and billions and billions and thrown that into the furnace of war. We have real needs and real things we could accomplish, but not if we burn up everything about our our country and our world um, in war. So I appreciate the, the sentiment. We're going to just go a couple more, and I'm going to start with this young man and go ahead and come forward. How old are you? 12. I'm 67. You talked about mass incarceration earlier, and while I know it's unjust in a lot of cases, I mean, if somebody's committed a crime, shouldn't they be put in jail? If they've been tried fairly, and, and if they've been proven guilty, tried fairly, shouldn't they go to jail for what they did? Well, let me ask you, which crime should you go to jail for? Which ones? Wait, can you repeat the question? Yeah, which crimes? You say, if they commit a crime, shouldn't they go to jail if everything is fair? So, if they commit the crime, shouldn't they go to jail? So, which crimes? If somebody gets a gun, and goes out and kills someone. Okay, so murder, what else? Assault, rape, drugs. Okay, wait, wait, drugs? Yes. How about smoking two joints? Okay, I'm only saying it, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to kind of beat up on you, but have a seat, don't give up the, um, I say two things, one is, of course, if people are, you know, do uh, outrageous things and 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 are a danger to the community and to themselves, of course. Then then you, you have a good point. The problem is over half of the 2.5 million people who are in jail, well over half, are in for nonviolent crimes. So the crimes that you mentioned were all violent. Now what about drugs? What about drug possession? Um, I mean, we really need to parse this a little more. And what I want you to think about, all of us, to think about together is let's think of a hundred things we could do for a person who's committed a crime before we put them in jail. What are a hundred alternatives to jail? Jail is expensive. Jail is ridiculously wasteful. It, it you know, it's, um, it's, you know, every day in this country, 50,000 people wake up in, in solitary confinement, which is a form of torture. Um, this is an outrage to humanity. So the question is, what could we do before jail? And I would posit a couple things. One is drug treatment, right? One is community service. Um, you know, the, when my kid, when my oldest son was a senior in high school, he got into a struggle with a kid about what else, a girl. And the kid came and put a boulder through the front windshield of our car. Should he have gone to jail? It was a pretty awful thing to do. It, it, it was an assault on me, even though I wasn't even in. And I went and talked to the kid, and we agreed that he had to make restitution. He had to take my car and get it fixed. And that he had to, you know, uh, apologize. And he had to do a lot of things. But jail seems to be inappropriate for a kid who broke a window, right? So that's what we have to get over, is the idea that every crime deserves jail. And once we get over that link, then we can begin to think about more, you know, more sane punishments or more sane sanctions for things that are wrong. And this is sometimes called um, restorative justice. If you commit an offense against somebody, you have a responsibility to restore that person to wholeness. 
that doesn't mean I want to break you. Let's say, you know, two years from now, God forbid, that you um, have a drink. You know, my wife is Ellie, who, who teaches uh, law, and one of her courses is called uh, Children in Trouble with the Law. And she always begins that course by saying to these smart law students who are in their 20s and 30s at Northwestern, she says, how many of you committed a crime as a kid? And the first five are brave, and they, come on, come on, you had a drink underage, okay, more. You smoked a joint, all right, all right. You took your mom's car without permission. We all committed a crime when we were a kid. That's in the nature of being an adolescent. And, and, and yet, we, those of us who are privileged, also had the opportunity to recover. We, when, we, when we broke curfew, we didn't go to jail. It wasn't a jailable crime for us. It is for some kids in Chicago, and that's really a problem, right? So that's that's what I would argue back to you. Is that okay? Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, I just want to say that um, let's see, I'm going to have a little trouble getting my thoughts back together. I've really gained so much from what you talked about. Firstly, I wanted to talk about, and this is a word I often mispronounce, ethnicity, is that right? Ethnicity. Ethnicity. The ethnicity in our prisons, is, is, isn't that another form of slavery? It's I'm, overrepresented with black people and Latinos, yes. And, and uh, I have, I know several, several white people have gotten out on parole way ahead of time because the jails are so crowded. Yeah, and, and I've had drug charges and I've never been to prison and I have black friends who've been to prison for similar drug, yeah. drug crimes. Yeah. So that is a problem to me. That yeah. is a problem to me. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, I had a father who was very right-wing. He was born pre-World War II and he fought World War II fought Korea, he fought the reconstruction, he then retired, he flew for Air America, and he always knew I was a liberal. But in his dying bed, he told me that we were the only, this was in 80, 1980, he said we were the only industrialized country that didn't have universal health care. And he thought that was just a shambles. And this is, and we're talking about a very right-wing man here. He also believed, and I'd like to hear what you say about this. He believed that Americans getting out of high school should do two years of community service, or they didn't have to be military. It could be any time. I love your dad. Okay, um, my dad was, you know, the head of Commonwealth Edison, very privileged. I grew up very privileged. We had very different political views, and he lived with me in my house the last five years of his life with Alzheimer's. We took care of him. He died at home. You know, family is important, and it's another example that we can love each other across. I used to come home from work, and he'd be listening to Fox News at full volume, and I'd come in and I'd turn it down, and then he'd say something crazy to me like, what is it these gay people want? And I'd say, they don't want to marry you, and he'd say, okay. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, but I, I appreciate what you're saying, and partly you're echoing what um, the brother said back here, you know, that left and right, it gets confusing. I mean, what does it really mean at the end of the day? On this question of community, of, of get out of high school and do a couple of years, I've, I've argued in print, um, I've written this, that I think that every 18-year-old should have to do a year of service, and that service has to not be defined as military service. It could be, in fact, we as a community could decide on 10 things you could choose from. Take care of the elderly, that's my favorite, because um, I am elderly. Uh, take care of kids, work in an emergency room, rebuilding the infrastructure, blah, blah, blah. And the military could be one option, but we as a community could decide, here are 10 things, and you must spend a year at the age of 18 after you, the, your school year at the age of 18, you must spend a year in community service. And at 28, and at 38, 48, 58, and 68. Wow. One year, that's six years out of your adult life, and it wouldn't hurt you. In fact, it'd be good for you. If you're some damn white shoes lawyer or some silly professor, take a year off. Go to the fields, do something. And you'll get a better perspective on your life, and you can stop being so driven and ambitious and crazy and you can kind of understand that we are in this together and we're all floating along on planet Earth and I think that we should, you know, I think that'd be good for us. I think it'd be good for our souls and I think it'd be good for our community 
And I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but the, where I get off the boat is when we say selective service or community or, or service, and we mean military service. I reject that. I don't think that we have to have that mean to conflate those two ideas. But I think the idea of community service is not a bad one. I think it's a good one. I think we can do it with minimal bureaucracy and a lot of spirit and heart. I'm going to take a couple more, and then I'm going to get out of here. So I got two, three up. Okay, sister. One question that's really bothering me right now, and since your story about the $2,500 dinner that you would check, what was the question and one that would be? She she never got to ask it because the blowhards who were with her were so noisy <laughs> that uh, she, you know. And it turned out I said right in the beginning, um, I'm delighted, you know. They came under a lot of attack from their right-wing brethren for having dinner with us because, as one of them said, um, we've had an airtight case until now that Obama's a bastard for eating with these people, and now you've messed that up. So, you know, they were, um, they were confused about what the, the point was, but I said to them right in the beginning, this is not an interview, and it's, not, it's, a, it's a conversation over dinner. That's all we're doing. And, um, and they pretty much respected that, and they weren't really prepared. But we had a couple of interesting arguments. You know, my favorite moment was Jamie Weinstein, this young cub reporter who was panting like a puppy dog and as eager as Jimmy Olsen. Um, he, he, he said to me as he was leaving, he said, I know what you're going to say, because you've said it before, but I want the truth. Did you write Obama's book? And I said, yes. He said, no. I knew you were going to say that. I want the truth. Did you? I said, yes. He said, no. <laughs> what do you want me to say, dude? You know, I mean, it was like, um, it was one of those kind of crazy repeating circles, right? We couldn't, we couldn't stop. But, uh, you know, no, she never got to ask her question. She was somewhat quiet and shy, and the big guys were blowing hard. Okay, I got two more. Yes, sir. Well, I'm not sure if I can predict that at all, but I, I have nothing but yeah, I have nothing but admiration and respect, but I think it depends on a lot of things. But what I admire to date is the willingness to do a couple of things that I think are central. One is the willingness to stand up and go out in the public square and be heard. Second, the, the desire to build a little bit of the future society we want to live in right here, right now. I mean, when we sat in at lunch counters, black and white together, we were saying, this is the world we want to live in. It's a world where black and white people can sit together. The occupied people are saying, this is the world we want to live in, where we can come together and have a public discussion and have a public square. And interestingly, you know, the New York Times and the other snarky observers say, ooh, there's a big fight going on at Occupy between the, kid, the, the intellectual students who are over here and the homeless who are over here. Of course they ridicule us. Of course they make fun of us. What's wrong with trying to build a community that includes intellectuals and homeless people? That's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. That's a smart thing. And will there be contradictions and conflict? Of course there will be. But that's nature. That's, that's human beings working together. And we shouldn't allow ourselves to be defined by them. We define <laughs> ourselves for ourselves. So I don't know what's coming next, but I'll tell you two things. When, when I was in New York, there were a couple debates going on, and I would want to remind us that, and this is something that we've debated in Chicago as well, that when we talk about nonviolent direct action, we're talking about direct action. My mother was not a nonviolent person because she sat on her privileged couch and watched the world go by. Nonviolent direct action disrupts what's in front of you. It's an attempt to perform a disruption of what you take to be wrong. And there is violence built into our society. So when you perform a disruption, often the response is violent. But you didn't cause the violence. You actually just, you know, up, you know, you, you surfaced it, right? So one thing is, I urge us to be nonviolent, direct action activists. And by that I mean, when they say, when the police come and say, as they did one night in Chicago, they took the microphone and they said, mic check. Everybody said, mic check, wait a minute, these guys are about to arrest us. Are you really going to, uh, okay, so we did that. And then they said, if you, we're, gonna, we're telling you now that the park will be cleared. And if you want to get arrested, line up over there and get into the wagon. I'm like, really? No. You know, I mean, yes, we're, we, we don't want to commit violence, but at the same time, 
we're not actually doing their work for them, we're performing resistance to their work, right? So that on the one side, there's that problem. On the other side, when I hear people say um, autonomy of action, I have a little bit of problem with that too. And the reason I have a problem with it isn't because I don't think that we should, that people should be allowed to act independently, I think they should. But I think we as a community, when we built an occupation, whether it's Detroit or Milwaukee or Springfield or DC or New York, when we built an occupation, we all have responsibility for the whole. And that means if you want to do independent action, that's cool, but remember, you're responsible to all of us. Don't go off and do something that's just you because you're on an ego trip. Don't do it because you think you look cool in the papers with a Molotov cocktail in your hand. No. You do what you do, but you do it with a mindfulness and a, and a moral responsibility to the community. And if we do that, we'll figure it out together. I'm sorry, but the, the black, the racist issue against Ron Paul. Ron Paul is a constitutionalist. He sees the Constitution doesn't recognize race. It only recognizes individuals. Therefore, your argument that Ron Paul would be against blacks or any other group opposed to them is absolutely incorrect because the Constitution, and Ron Paul is a constitutionalist, recognizes only individuals. What about where it says well, black? Well, well, the Constitution actually, they, they, they it's, a little, there's, it's a little more complicated than that. The Constitution recognizes black people as two-thirds of a human being. So that's in the Constitution. And, and that's been rewritten, and there's much more to be right. But the fact is that Ron Paul has written some of the most scurrilous, racist stuff in his newsletter, which he now claims is the one place where he's not consistent. He says, oh, I forgot to read it. It's called the Ron Paul Newsletter. And he calls Martin Luther King, you know, the hate whitey day. I mean, it's all there, so you can check it out. All I'm saying is we're going to disagree on that. I have deep respect for you and, and for what you're fighting for. I urge us all to think more deeply, to talk with one another more respectfully than we see around us. And again, thank you all for having me, and thanks for coming. Thank you very much for coming. I'd like uh, everyone to acknowledge this morning. Thank you. She's like the owner of this establishment, and uh, she put up with a little bit of flack for having Bill here, and uh, we're very proud of her. And we thank her for her contribution, and thank you all for coming out. So. <laughs>